now, your Chris 6 weather forecast. Wow, that's just some of the raw power of Mother Nature as torrential rain and tornadoes devastated the Houston area this afternoon. This is some video of from uh, near the Deer Park area out there. Among the damage there, a roof ripped off an apartment complex. A number of trees and power lines were taken down. No word yet on how many homes have been impacted and how many people have or may have been injured there. Fortunately, wasn't the same story here in our area. Rain, of course, did make an appearance. And right now, some chilly temperatures moving in. Chief Meteorologist Dale Nelson joins us now with an update on our weather, Dale. That's right, Pat, and uh, fortunately we did not have any tornadic activity here, even though we did have a tornado watch for our northern counties, but it didn't materialize. That's, that happens in a watch sometimes, but for the first time uh, ever, the uh, National Weather Service in Houston issued a tornado emergency, which is one step beyond a tornado warning. Uh, you have a watch, a warning, and now a tornado emergency. It's a rare uh, event when it happens. It's a severe threat to human lives and they're saying it's imminent or ongoing. Catastrophic damage occurs and reliable sources confirm a tornado or the fact that there's a clear radar evidence of a damaging tornado on the ground. And it happened right there this afternoon as it plowed through the region. We were just on the southern fringe of this and then snow that we'll see later in the broadcast in the uh, North Texas area and the Red River Valley. Since midnight, there's the rainfall here. Again, we had about a quarter of an inch on average in town, but a half inch officially at the airport. It rained heavily around Beeville and down towards George West, but not enough to make a difference in our water supply. And temperatures right now are generally in the uh, low to mid 50s. There are some 40s uh, popping up and we are going down tonight. How low do we go and how long does it last? In a few minutes, I'll be back to tell you all about it, Pat. Okay, J Dale, we'll check back in with you in just a couple of moments. Today, the Corpus Christi City Council got a grim assessment of our water supply. City Manager Peter Zanoni and Michael Murphy, the COO of CC Water, told council members that current water levels are 10% lower than they were this time last year. According to a briefing from the National Weather Service, we can expect hotter and drier weather through April. While current drought maps show the city is not in a drought, our watershed and recharge zones are seeing severe to extreme drought conditions. With no significant rain in those areas expected anytime soon, next week the City Council will be briefed on proposed revisions to the drought contingency plan. Those changes include changing the trigger points for that plan. A vote on those changes is expected in February. It is a huge loss to this department and he, he's going to be missed dearly. Missed but remembered on Sunday, Fulton Volunteer Assistant Fire Chief Jackie Mundine died after a three-year battle with stomach cancer. Taylor Alanis reports on his legacy and how his colleagues and family are asking you to honor him. He was a, a true leader. To know Jackie was to know you had a friend. A friend. Jackie would go out of the way to help anybody. He would also kind of take you under his wing and, and, and teach you. A teacher and a hero. He was the backbone of this department and what we are today. Jackie Mundine, the assistant fire chief of the Fulton Volunteer Fire Department, lost his battle to cancer on Sunday, January 22nd. Roughly three years ago, he was diagnosed with a, uh, a stomach cancer. Um, never let it phase him. Mundine served the department for more than 45 years. He joined the department in 1977. Taking on every role you can think of, from firefighter, EMT, assistant chief, and chief. He's uh, gained his master's certification from the State Fire Marshal Association. He's also the fire marshal for the town of Fulton for quite a few years. He was even an original organizer of the Fulton Oyster Fest. Oyster Fest is probably about a quarter of our budget. This is an interview we did with Mundine just last year about that the largest fundraiser for the volunteer that. fire most, department, most a career he held so very close to his heart and continued doing even through rigorous treatment. Uh, I still don't think it's real. I'm still waiting, still waiting on a phone call from him uh, to tell me what we need. Leaving behind a legacy, his friends and colleagues wish people can carry on. Join your local fire department. Um, 
We, we meet every Thursday at 7.30 p.m. We're always at, looking for volunteers. Something they know he would want. Come in, step up, do the part, help your community. Taylor Alanese. Because that's who he was. Chris Six News. A procession for Chief Mundine will be held Friday at 9 a.m. at the Charlie Marshall Funeral Home in Rockport. A visitation will be held immediately after until 9 p.m. And then on Saturday at 10.30 a.m., a memorial service will be held at the fire station. Another way to honor Mundine, his family asks instead of flowers, that donations be made to the organization he loved with all of his heart, the Rockport Fulton Volunteer Fire Department. Like they say, you know, leave no man behind in life and in death. It's a story of courage and the ultimate sacrifice, the heroic act done by four military chaplains and the memorial local veterans are planning to honor them. That story next in this week's Veterans in Focus. This is Veterans in Focus, sponsored by USA Concrete Coatings, from concrete to custom in just one day. On tonight's Veterans in Focus, some local veterans are remembering the courage of four unlikely war heroes. This as we approach the 80th anniversary of one of the worst attacks at sea during World War II. Inside this building, right off Castoris Road, All right. this group of men with the American Legion Post 364 gathered to plan a memorial service. Gentlemen, let's just make sure that all the footings are the same color here. And by the sound of it, service to their country that they gave, you would think that they lost one of their own. Like they say, you know, leave no man behind in life and in death. Though they never knew George L. Fox, Alexander D. Good, Clark V. Poling, and John P. Washington, they can't help but admire how these men could be so brave. They actually did something that was completely just beautiful. On February 3rd, 1943, two weeks before this USS Lexington was commissioned for battle in World War II, 900 American soldiers and contractors were on board the U.S. Army Transport Dorchester in the North Atlantic. They were so close to their destination of Greenland, but they never made it to the battlefield. The ship was struck by an enemy torpedo from a German U-boat, killing some instantly. With no lights and taking on water, as you can imagine, the crew became frantic. But there to calm them and guide them to safety were these four chaplains, young first lieutenants, two Protestant, one rabbi, and one Roman Catholic. And when supplies ran out, without hesitation, these four men of faith gave the ultimate sacrifice. They gave up their own life vests to those who had none. No greater love for a fellow human being. And then they linked arms together, singing and praying as the ship went down. They gave of themselves so that someone else can live, someone else can go home, extended their life just a bit longer. Who knows how long they got to live. Which is why these men are carrying on an annual tradition, remembering chaplains, the most unlikely war heroes, who on that day displayed the most uncommon valor. Nearly 700 soldiers died in the Dorchester disaster at sea 80 years ago. The four chaplains were posthumously awarded the Distinguished Service Cross and Purple Heart. Next Saturday, February 4th at 10 a.m., the local American Legion Post 364 will hold a special memorial to honor them and their selfless acts. Remarkable human beings right there. We'll be right back. Now, your Chris 6 weather forecast. No, you're not looking at images out of the northeast. That's actually Lubbock today. Around noon today, the National Weather Service said that that area had recorded almost five inches of snow. This is all part of that system that brought that devastating weather to the Houston area that we told you about a little earlier. Chief Meteorologist Dale Nelson joins us right now. Dale, we didn't have the snow, obviously, in our <laughs> forecast, but we did have some frigid temperatures tonight, don't we? Yeah, I think it's going to go down into the upper 30s over much of the inland sections of South Texas. Uh, 
One thing good about the rain we had today is you don't have to shovel it like they do up north. But uh, the big storms and severe weather was basically from Victoria into Houston and beyond. So we missed out on the real heavy rain for the most part, but we also missed out on all of the severe weather. And again, we did see rain here of significance, uh, the biggest rain so far of the year. And in fact, in some cases for the last eight weeks, where we picked up a half inch of rain officially here in town, about a quarter of an inch. Angela Wyatt out in Alice had about a quarter of an inch and Smitty up in Rockport had about a third. Officially, they had seven hundredths and uh, around Beeville, there was one to two inches in green here and in southeastern parts of Live Oak County. There was some rain in the watershed, but not enough as we talked about in earlier broadcasts to make a difference. It was windy too. We had gusts ahead of the front at 48 miles an hour, 38 in Kingsville and 39 over at the Naval Air Station. Highs today reached 77 here, 80 in Kingsville, but only 70 out to the west in Catula and 71 in George West. It's 53 right now. The wind's six miles an hour from the northwest, so the bay's not gonna come into play here. And I think we're headed down into the upper 30s with those clear skies, already down to 49 in Kingsville and 46 in Rockport. So it's getting chilly out there as the winds continue to subside here on the future tracker. They'll be blowing generally 10 miles an hour or less in the morning, except along the coast and then lighter in the afternoon. And then we'll see light winds again starting out here on Thursday and again on Thursday afternoon. Feel like temperatures in the 30s in the morning. In fact, low 30s over many of the inland sections. So a bundle up, especially the kids off to school and then low 30s again on the wind chill here on Thursday morning. So again, we are looking at winter weather here in the end of January for us. Temperatures continue to drop already in the 30s in the hill country and 28 up in Amarillo with that snow on the ground there. Courtesy of this upper level low that brought the severe weather that's now marching through the Tennessee Valley and Mississippi River Valley with the very dry air in the region. We'll see lots of sunshine here the next couple of days. Our front marches off to the east. The clouds come back on Friday late and then we'll see a few little showers along the coast Saturday night and into Sunday as that front pushes through the next one reinforcing the cool air but we're not going to get much rain out of that next front as you can see here it's on the low end of the rain scale so walking the dog tonight looks like this we'll see temperatures in the 40s by around 2 30 in the morning with the northwest wind slowing down upper 30s inland including officially out at the airport 45 in flower bluff and 40s along the coast but it's going to be a cold night South Texas standard wise was 66 breezy here tomorrow, especially in the morning, but sunshine and gorgeous through the afternoon hours. Watching this Arctic air mass, this uh, polar vortex around Hudson Bay, it's slowly easing southward by next Friday, the 3rd of February, and that freezing line is getting close to us. And I think we'll uh, potential to see a freeze here sometime between the 2nd and 6th of February. So. Hold off on planting for now. I would anyway. I am 39 and 66, 38 and 62 for Thursday. Great weather the next couple of days. 61 Friday, clouding up Saturday. Isolated shower Saturday night and Sunday. The next front Sunday night cools us off again on Monday. All right, that's a look at our chilly forecast. We've got more with Larissa and Pat right after this. Welcome back today on Capitol Hill. Senators grilled the top executive from Ticketmaster Live Nation after that Taylor Swift ticket sales debacle left millions of fans without tickets. No price gouging, no more. While fans protested outside, lawmakers inside pressed the head of Ticketmaster's parent company. The Taylor Swift ticket fiasco has renewed scrutiny on Ticketmaster and whether its merger with concert promoter Live Nation created an unfair competitive advantage. That was the central question in today's Senate Judiciary hearing, which featured smaller competitors and artists. Is Ticketmaster a monopoly? Unequivocally. Yes, sir. Without a doubt. Yes, absolutely. A group of Taylor Swift fans isn't waiting around for change. They have filed a class action lawsuit accusing Ticketmaster Live Nation of several antitrust violations as well as fraud and breach of contract. Sports Director Larissa Liska joining us right now. And if folks want some tickets to winning basketball, well, the Islander women's basketball team may be the right way to go. Right, Larissa? That's right, Pat. They are on top of the Southland Conference right now whole lot of senior leadership to help out. Next, 
We'll introduce you to one of those seniors sparking a winning mentality. Stay with us.